To download more lectures, learn more about our project, and to help support it, visit www.bayina.com slash dream. That's B-A-Y-Y-I-N-A-H slash dream. You are free to share these recordings with family and friends. Thank you and Jazakumullah Khairan for helping us make our dream a reality. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Al-Qari'atu Mal-Qari'ah Wa ma adraka mal-qari'ah Yawma yakunu al-nasu kal-farash al-mabithuth Wa takunu al-jibalu kal-ihni al-manthush Fa-amma man thakulat mawazinuh Fahuwa fi aishatir radiyah Wa amma man khaffat mawazinuh فأمه هاوية وما أدراك ما هي نار حامية رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحد العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصل بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وان شاء الله تعالى today we're going to be doing a study of surah al-qari'ah and uh, before we get into the study itself there's a little bit of background necessary as far as its placement in the Quran we are studying a, th- uh, a third surah in a series of four surahs this belongs to a quartet of four part series of discussion in the Quran and this is a third part of it the first two surahs in this chain of surahs was Surah Al-Zilzal, إِذَا زُلْزِلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا That was the first surah. The one after that was وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحَا This is the third, and then the fourth one after this, أَلْهَكُمُ التَّكَاثُرُ So they're all four. Now, what makes them bunch together? This happens by, by, by the way, theme and subject order and sequence in the Qur'an. In Surah Al-Zilzal, we, had a, we found a unique relationship between it and the, the surah after it, Surah Al-Adiyat. What was that relationship? You know Surah Al-Zilzal talks about the last day and the earthquake of the last day. It focuses on the, the hereafter and the destruction of this earth. Surah Al-Adiyat depicts, completely changes the scene and starts talking about the reality on the ground. How are people's attitudes right now? While Surah Al-Zilzal was telling us the attitude of people on the day of judgment. وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا That's going to be his attitude, his word on the day of judgment. But what's the reality right now? Is he saying that now? Is he fearful now? No. As a matter of fact, right now, إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لِرَبِّهِ لَكَنُودٍ That's his state right now. So there was a comp- contrast between his state on that day versus his state right now. Now, which is, uh, by the way, which is particularly disturbing because if he knows that's coming, then his state right now should change. So there's this contrast. Now we find another two surahs, Surah Al-Qari'ah. Al-Qari'atu mal-Qari'ah. Wa ma adraka mal-Qari'ah. Yawma yakunu al-Nas kal-Farash al Again, a focus just like Surah Zilzal, a focus on the Akhirah. The, almost the entire Surah is f- directly focused on the Akhirah, and it's a little leaning towards fihi janibul indar. It's 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 you know it's sided more towards warning rather than good news. You know, sometimes when Allah speaks about paradise and hellfire, He s- speaks about both of them equally. Sometimes He gives one thing more weight than the other in some passages. In this one, in this Surah, He talks more about the hellfire than He does the paradise. Okay. So this is again, Day of Judgment. As we'll see, Al-Qari'ah in its meaning, it's talking about the Day of Judgment and one of its calamitous events. But then as soon as, as, soon as this surah is done, again another surah about the attitude of the human being on the earth. Al-Hakumu takathur Hatta zultubu al-Maqabid. Your mutually shared urge to gain plenty in this world has deluded you. Right? So there's again that contrast between Akhirah and then Dunya. There was Akhirah in Zilzal and then Dunya in Al-Adiyat. Then Akhirah in Al-Qari'ah, and again Dunya in the coming Surah, which is uh, going to be at takathur Then we find in the previous Surah, even, so, so what I'm trying to get at then is, in these four Surahs, the first and the third are very similar, and the second and the fourth are very similar. Right? That's what we're trying to get at. But even though that's the case, and there are very strong parallels between them, even the third and the, f- or the second and the third, because they're next to each other, even they have relationships between each other. For example, we find in Surah Al-Adiyat, the surah we studied last time, أَفَلَا يَعْلَمُوا إِذَا بُعْثِرَ مَا فِي الْقُدُورِ 
rather? Doesn't he know? Does he then not know what is, you know, what's going to happen when whatever is in the graves is going to be topsy turvy and it's going to be yanked out, it's going to be pulled out? Allah just left it there. The only thing in addition he told us about that day is wa husila ma fi sudur. That's the only thing we learned in that surah in addition. Okay. So we learned what's the, whatever the contents of the graves will be brought out and whatever is in the chest will be exposed. That the two things. Now, What's going to happen after they come out of the grave? What's going to happen after what they have in their chest will be exposed? What's the next scene in this series of events? That's what's going to happen in this surah. We're going to find the scales are going to be brought forward. Somebody's scales will be heavy, somebody's scales will be light. That's the next logical progression. So there's this, you know, the question marks that are left at the end of the last surah are now being addressed in this surah. It's almost an, a completion of the subject. Similarly, uh, coming back to the, the parallel between the first and the third, Surah Al-Zilzal and Surah Al-Qari'ah, both deal with Qiyamah, both from a stylistic point of view, when, mention the word thiqal. So you have, for example, wa akhrajatil الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا The word athqal came up, for the plural of thiqal. Then, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا وَشَرًا Right, so it's mithqal. Here we're going to find, in this surah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ that same verb, same word comes up. So this is the first and the third are even stylistically connected because the same verb and the same terminology is coming up again. Then we find in Surah Al-Zilzal, Allah Azza wa Jal had said, يَوْمَ إِذِينْ يَصْدُرُ النَّاسِ أَشْتَاتًا لِيُرَوْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ People will be spread out on that day. They will be gone in every which direction. So they may, show, so they may be shown their deeds. But there's a dis discussion about people being spread out. Now that this discussion takes the next step. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ Like spread out moths. Another image is added to that scene. First it was mentioned in brief. Okay, they're going to be ashtata. They're going to be dispersed. Okay. But then Allah adds a detailed image. And you know, Quran, its details are captured in imagery. Allah paints a picture with words. And when you pay attention to that image, you'll understand more about what Allah Azza wa Jalla is depicting. The reality He's depicting. So there's that connection between these two surahs also. But then there's a very subtle uh, uh, connection between these two things. Which is that there is a sequence of events as far as us and our deeds and our judgment is concerned. On the Day of Judgment, there's a sequence of events. The first event, as far as judgment is concerned, is we're going to be handed our book. In either the right hand or the left hand, you're going to be handed your book. Okay. The next progression of that is you're going to be shown what you did. You're going to be shown. And once you are shown, then it will be weighed. Then it's going to be weighed. And once it's weighed, then you will be judged. So there's this four step thing. First you're handed the book, then you're shown what the contents of the book are, what you've done. Then it's going to be weighed and scaled and valued, evaluated. And then finally, after the evaluation, your judgment. Surah so Zilzal dealt with one part of this event. لِيُرَوْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ So they may be shown their deeds. So the, the, we're starting from the second point. Because the first part of it where your books are handed to you, a few surahs ago has already occurred. فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ وَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِشِمَالِهِ That was the first part. The second part was you're being shown what you did. لِيُرَوْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ Okay. But that still doesn't say enough about evaluation. And we said when we were studying Surah Al-Zilzal, there's a difference between sh being shown your deeds and having them evaluated. Once they go for evaluation, something else is going to happen. And we'll study more of that today, inshaAllah ta'ala. Because you know, just the, the deeds are on the outside, but Allah doesn't just judge, judge the deed. What else does He judge? The intentions behind them. Right? Not just the deed, but the intentions behind them. So you may think you have a pretty good pile of good deeds, and then you take them before Allah and you found out they're worth nothing. First you're shown your deeds though, then they're evaluated. Once you get, take them for evaluation, they're worthless. Right? Now, so what we learn from that basically is, you have your deeds and then you have your intentions. And where are the intentions? They're in the heart, right? So Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Zilzal, He mentions the deeds. لِيُرَوْ أَعْمَالَهُمْ In Surah Al-Adiyat, what does He mention? وَحُصِّلَ مَا فِي الصُّدُورِ What's the Now the deeds and the intentions come together. Now they are ready for evaluation. فَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ وَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ What's coming in the next surah, in, in this surah, Al-Qari'ah, is now they're ready for evaluation because it combines the deeds and the intentions. SubhanAllah, it's a beautiful progression between these three things. Okay? So that's what, another thing we learn in, uh, uh, in this phenomenal surah. Now we begin inshaAllah ta'ala with a discussion of the surah itself. القارعة ما القارعة 
We're going to bunch these three ayat together because they're very similar. The word al-qari'ah in the Arabic language from a morphology point of view means it's, in, it's what's called an ism fa'il. In English grammar we call it an active participle. What that means is it's a noun that does something. Like you know how in English you say farmer? That's an active participle. Why? Because he engages in the act of what? Farming. Teacher. The one who teaches. Right? Speaker, the one who speaks. Okay. Al-Qari'a, if you want to be very basic and raw in translation, that which rattles, the rattler, okay, or the knocker, or the destroyer even. It's Allah is describing something that engages in the act of something. The noun is something by definition that engages in the act of something. This is an ism fa'il. Now, the thing of it is, the word Qari'a in Arabic, is used specifically, qara'a as a verb is used when two things hit against each other and they produce a loud noise. A loud, not just loud, but disturbing noise. If you are not disturbed by the noise, you will not call it, will you not use the word qara'a for it. But if you're perturbed by it, annoyed by it, scared by it, then you will call it al qari'a. Okay? For example, if two cars crash into each other and you hear a loud, loud sound, you, would, you can call that qari'a. Why? Because it disturbed you. And figuratively also, if you're in a situation in life that you're in a lot of trouble, this is what Ibn al-Fadis says, rahmahullah. He says that, he says that al-qari'a is also used in Arabic for when you are in a tough, tough situation. When you're in a horrible situation, then you use al-qari'a because you, it's like this really loud noise has disturbed you and has taken your peace away. That's what a bad situation does, it takes your peace away. The way it's used in Arabic literature, again, very interesting. يُقْرَعُ abdu bil asa. You know, the, the, somebody's watching somebody's slave get beaten. And he's saying he's being knocked around with al-asa, the staff, the cane, nowadays cane, but really staff, okay, a big stick. But yuqra'u meaning he's getting hit so hard, every time he gets hit it makes a really not loud noise, and you just go, ah. You know, it disturbs you, because you know a human being is getting hit. And it's not just he's getting hit, it's making a really loud noise, so it's a pretty nasty hit that he's getting hit with. So this is the word yuqra'u. Then qara'a fi maqra'ihi, this is, um, you know, it's because it's similar to daraba, its masdar is maqra' as, you know, like madrab also. And it's the infinitive form. But what this does is it actually gives it a figurative meaning. In other words, when you insult someone or reproach someone or uh, humiliate them in public, then it's the same as you beating them really loud. So it can be used in this humiliating fashion also. The word itself can be used in that way also. Of course, the most common usage of it is qara' al-bab to knock on the door in the middle of the night when people are sleeping and when you knock really hard, what happens? It disturbs their sleep. It bothers them and their peace is gone. And of course, a few things happen. First of all, you weren't expecting it. Second of all, it disturbed your peace. Third of all, you're even scared. Fourth of all, you don't know who's there. You don't know what this is about. It comes as a shock to you, right? So there are lots of things happening with al qariah Allah uses this as one of the descriptions of the Day of Judgment. al azifa al-Kubra, right? There are many different descriptions of the Day of Judgment. This is one of them. And the, the use of the benefit of this word from a liter literary point of view is what Allah is teaching us about the Day of Judgment is it is like that night visitor who comes all of a sudden and you weren't expecting him. And when he comes, when this Day of Judgment comes, you're going to be what? You're going to be shocked. You're not going to be expecting it. And the, the rattling noise is going to wake you up, meaning right now you are what? Asleep. You're asleep and it's going to come and it's going to wake you up. And when it wakes you up, you won't know what hit you. You don't know what's going on. Which has been described in Surah Al-Zilzal already because the human being said, Ma laha, what's wrong with it? What just happened? The, the shock will, ca will capture you. So the word Al-Qari'ah is very descriptive in regards to the Day of Judgment. Very beautiful usage. So now, having said this, we, ha we do have to deal with a very interesting nuance in this, in this, in this ayah. I will give you the opinions of Mufassirun a little bit later on, the traditional Mufassirun, but I want to share with you a brilliant discussion that a Shaykh Sha'rawi rahimahullah had in regards to these three ayats. This is, the, this is one of two surahs in which this style is the beginning of the surah. Al Qari'atu, Mal Qari'atu, wa ma adraka, Mal Qari'ah. Al Haqqatu, Mal Haqqatu, wa ma adraka, Mal Haqqah. Now, Al Qari'ah, we just said the rattler, the loud noise. Okay? Then, or the destructive noise. What is the destructive noise? Mal qari'ah. Then a third, wa ma abraka, 
مَا الْقَارِعَ What will give you any clue what this destructive noise is? Three times. الْقَارِعَ The word occurs three times. الْقَارِعَ مَا الْقَارِعَ وَمَا أَدْرَكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ By the way, in the Qur'an, as we will see later on, this word occurs a total of five times. Of them, three times right here. So two more times left. Okay, elsewhere in the Qur'an. But we get to that a little bit later. The point I'm trying to come, bring to your attention, first of all, كَلِمَةٌ تَكَرَّرَتْ ثَلَاثَةْ مَرَّةٍ this is a word that has been repeated three times. But then, الْمَرَّةُ الْأُولَى كَأَنَّ فِيهِ إِبْهَامٍ The first time it is mentioned, it is as though there is some ambiguity in it. It's not explicitly clear. In other words, when you just say a word in Arabic, especially when you put al on a word, this is considered a mubtada. It's the opening of a sentence. And when you say the opening of a sentence, what does the listener expect? The closing, the subject. If the subject is mentioned, they expect the predicate. For example, if I said to you, the city of Dallas, and I didn't say anything more. You're left, the, the reader's left thinking, what about the city of Dallas? You know, there's confusion. What, what do you want to tell me? You didn't finish what you were going to say. Allah says al-qari'ah, but He doesn't finish it. The ayah is done. What question comes in your mind? The question that comes in your mind is, what calamity? What rattling? When that question is produced in your mind, it is as though Allah Azza wa Jal reads your mind and says what in the next ayah? Are you wondering what this qari'ah is? And whenever there's a question asked, whenever there's a question asked, the principle is, إِبْهَامٌ يَدْعُ الْإِنسَانِ أَنْ يَسْأَلَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ The ambiguity makes the human being question, what is al-qari'ah? What is it? And so naturally the next ayah is, مَا الْقَارِعَةِ But whenever you have a question, then you, it necessitates the يَتَطَلَّبُ الْجَوَابِ it, it demands an answer. It demands an answer. And as soon as the, the curiosity and the, the desire to seek an answer is produced in the mind, Allah Azza wa lets us know, you can't know for yourself. There's no way you can get the answer to that unless I give it to you. وَمَا أَضْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ What would give you any clue? What would give you even the slightest idea what al qariah happens to be? Okay, so this is the, the, the progression between these three and we'll, we'll talk about how other scholars have added to this discussion also. So لا تستطيع أن تجيب عليها. Yeah. Unless Allah tells you, yes. Inshallah. Because this is being recorded, let's continue the flow, inshallah. But I will address your questions at the end, ibnillah. Okay. But there is, so there is one really powerful thing here that's being overlooked. And that is that Allah uses a word, al qariah that the Arabs are familiar with. This is something the Arabs know. We just told you the meaning of the, wor the, the word. It's being used as a verb. It's being used when a loud sound is made. It's not something unfamiliar. To take a word for something that is so familiar, and then use it and say, what is it? You will never know what it is. The thing is, from a linguistic point of view, they know what that is. They know what that is. And here we come to a very important realization about the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal coins terms in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa Jal you know, he, uh, it's called valorization of a language. He puts terminology in the language that he takes ownership of, and before the Qur'an it had one meaning, but after the Qur'an, it has another meaning. Allah invaded that language. For example, the word salah, salah, before the Qur'an was revealed, before the, the revelation came, it had a word, it's an Arabic word. It had a meaning. But after the Qur'an was revealed, even the kuffar would not use it the way they used to because now Allah invaded that word with His revelation. That, that word has a separate meaning now. Hajj actually means to make pilgrimage to a place of importance. It's not, it's not ex explicitly used for what? The Kaaba. But once Allah used the word Hajj, now you cannot, no Arab can now use it for anything other than Hajj of the house of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal took ownership of that word. And this is part of the power of the Qur'an and the impact it had to coin a term and to take a word that already has a meaning and to give it a new meaning. How does that happen? You know, by the way, this happens even in our time. A word is taken, a word that has a meaning in language, and then it's given a new meaning altogether that didn't exist before. And the way it's done is by popular culture, by media exposure, by constant repetition. And guess what the Qur'an did? When the Qur'an was revealed, what did the Sahaba do? They would iterate and they would reiterate and they would reiterate and they would reiterate until it became part of the discourse of the society itself. The, 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 the repetition in the Qur'an, right, <coughs> of certain terms. 
And then Allah coining certain terms. So when from here on out, when somebody uses the word Al-Qari'ah, they will never use it the same way again. Allah took unique ownership of that word, subhanAllah. Okay. Now, this again, another very important uh, uh, consideration is what is this qari'ah referring to? We already said it's a loud sound, but more specifically in religious terms, how do we understand it? We know that the Day of Judgment is full of many calamities. And what, by use of this word, what we're learning is there are going to be a lot of things striking against each other. Now you, we just made mention of a car accident or a train wreck or an explosion. One thing strikes against another thing. Imagine everything is striking against everything. The sun is striking against the moon. The oceans are being rattled. The earth is being rattled. The graves are being rattled. The stars are being rattled. Everything is in motion. Everything's colliding into everything else. This is al qariah This can only be described. One of its very peculiar and powerful descriptions is it's just a day of great clash and striking against one another. Now, having said that, the day of judgment has been described in stages. And in one place in the Quran, Allah Azza wa Jal says, uh, he talks about two times, the, the trumpet being blown, the horn being blown twice. Okay, once and then a second time. And then in another place as we will see soon in the Quran, this nufiqah fi sur is mentioned a third time. Most ulama tend to agree that the, the blowing will actually occur three times based on the, the ayat of the Qur'an and the sequencing of them, they will occur, this will occur three times. The first is this nafqat uh, faz'ah. Uh, in other words, when Allah Azza wa Jal commands the horn to be blown, there will be terror widespread on the earth. There will be absolute terror on the earth. And by this time, all the believers' souls are gone. And when it's blown, then you know, there's all this chaos and calamity, wild animals are being herded together, and all, all this stuff is happening. Then another time, and when this time it's blown, death. Fasa'iqa. Everybody just collapses and falls apart. Everything dies immediately. Then we don't know how much time in between the two, but then there's a third, and when this one's blown, what happens? Everybody comes back to life. And most mufassirun comment that this qari'ah, this rattling noise that's being referred to here, which is another terminology for nafqatul sur, this is referring to the third when we come out of our graves. The, that final one, that's what's being referred to. Why do they say it's the final one? Because in this surah, we get right to the judgment. And how can you get to the judgment unless it's the third one? Because the first one doesn't lead to judgment. The first one leads to the second, second to the third, and the third one to judgment. So because of that, most mufassirun comment that this is referring to that third one. By the way, other places, let's, let's make quick reference inshallah at least. The, 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 the blowing of the trumpet where, or, or the horn where there's going to be absolute terror is defined, for example, in the beginning of Surah Al-Hajj. Allah says, Ya ayyuhan nasu attaqu rabbakum inna zalzalata sa'ati shay'un azim. Have fearful consciousness of your master. No doubt the, the earthquake of that day is a huge and enormous thing. Yawma tarawnaha tadhalu kullu murdi'atin amma arda'at. The day on which you will see every, every breastfeeding mother, animal and human being will drop whatever she used to feed. Allah didn't even say she'll drop her child, he'll say whatever, as though it doesn't, she doesn't even remember what that is. And every carrier, meaning every pregnant animal and human being, will drop whatever they were carrying. They'll just go into labor and deliver immediately out of shock. And you will see people drunk, and they're not drunk at all. You know when somebody's drunk, they're kind of like shaking around, moving around like this, they can't stand straight. The earth will be shaking so much that they can't stand straight, right? That's what's, what you're going to see them. <coughs> so this is the first one, where this terror is widespread on the earth. Then we find, uh, in regards to as we find, وَنُفِخَ فِي الصُّورِ فَصَعِقَ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ إِلَّا مَنْ شَاءَ اللَّهِ And, and it will, you know, the sur will be blown into, and everyone in the heavens and the earth will, will cease to live. Except the one who Allah wills, meaning Israfil, according to most Mufassirun. Because he'll survive this one, and then Allah will give him death, and then bring him back to life. ثُمَّ نُفِخَ فِيهِ أُخْرَى Then it will be blown again. فَإِذَا هُمْ قِيَامٌ يَنظُرُونَ Then they will be standing, looking at each other. So that's the second and third one is what's being referred to here. The first one was Fazr, the, the terror. And the second and third one have been combined in the other ayah. Okay. Similarly, 
when Allah speaks about this final one, He refers to this one the most, by the way, this last one, when we will come out of our graves. He calls this by إِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةٌ يَوْمَ يَدْعُ الدَّاعِ إِلَى شَيْءٍ نُكُرٍ Right? The day on which a caller calls to something horrifying, calls to something unheard of, something alien. So this is, the, most of the time when the Qur'an makes reference to that call, or that loud so sound, or the scolding, it's referring to the third, the final one, where we'll become, where we, we will be coming out of our graves. Like I said before, the only other surah that has this style of beginning is Al-Haqqah, Mal-Haqqah, Wa Ma Adraka Mal-Haqqah. In a unique parallel between these two surahs, remember I said how many times does the word Al-Qari'ah occur in the Qur'an? Five times? The fourth time is actually in Surah Al-Haqqah. Which begins in a similar way. So Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ وَعَادٌ بِالْقَارِعَةِ Qari'a occurs in that. So there's another you know, interesting nuance and parallel between these two surahs in addition. The final time this word occurs in the Qur'an is in Surah Al-Ra'd. And in Surah Al-Ra'd it actually occurs in its generic meaning, in the meaning of a calamity, or terrible calamity. وَلَا يَزَالُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا تُصِيبُهُمْ بِمَا صَنَعُوا قَارِعَةٌ we won't go into that ayah in detail, but just know when it's used in that ayah, it's referring to a horrible calamity, a difficult situation, kind of like what Ibn al-Fadis was describing when I told you his opinion on the meaning of the word. As far as the grammatical analysis of the first ayah, al-qari'ah, there are three things you should know. <coughs> the first is the concept of hadf. Hadf means that there's something omitted, something's not said. We said the, the subject is there, but the predicate isn't there, right? So some opinions are Al-Qari'atu Atiyatun This loud rattling calamity is on its way You better know is on its way That on its way is not said but it's understood That's one opinion grammatically Another opinion is that this word is the subject It's the fa'il and the fi'l mahdhuf the, the verb of it is understood So what is it? لَتَأْتِيَنَّ الْقَارِعَةِ For sure the calamity is coming so the word, the verb for coming or arriving is understood before it and just al-qari'ah is mentioned. But the third is the one I personally and the scholars of, you know, the scholars of grammar talk about one kind of thing and then the scholars of balagha talk about something else. They go a step beyond the grammar. And really I find that a little more convincing. Because language cannot be reduced to technicalities. Language is, you know, it's really an art form. It's rooted in science. Arabic is rooted in a lot of science. But then once you're done with the science, you know what you move on to? Art. And that's kind of like any science. You know architecture? A lot of science. But in the end, you have to have a beautiful building if you want to call it good architecture. So there's an art part of it, art component. But the art component is later what comes first, of course. The science part, right? Similar to the appreciation of Arabic language. Grammar is very technical, very scientific, very mathematical. But once you get to a certain level, now you can experience the artistic beauty in it. You go a step further and you don't lose yourself only in technicalities. Well, on the side, this is my advice to students of grammar because when you're studying grammar, it can get pretty boring and technical and you know, too many details and you say, ah, I don't need to study this. What's the point of all this? Well, you won't see the point yet. Just like you know, when you're studying eighth grade mathematics, you'll be like, why am I learning this? But one day when you become an architect, you'll say, I'm glad I learned my times tables because right? I couldn't have done this if I hadn't done that. Right? So you'll see the appreciation of it later on in life. So the third rhetorical benefit of al-qari'ah by itself is this. When does somebody speak in a way where they only say one word and not even a whole sentence? Have you ever heard some, when did some, somebody say things, for example, like, fire! They would just say fire, not a whole sentence. There is a fire in this building in room 257. No, 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 no. They would just say what? Fire! What does that indicate? Indica it indicates a state of emergency. It indicates a state of urgency in which there's no time to talk in details. No, it's already coming. It's right here. You know, if it was coming months from now, years from now, generations from now, then you can explain it in full detail. But if you see it coming right away, then what do you do? You're at a loss of words. You don't say, I, I, I heard that there is a fire code violation in this building and maybe if we don't address it in the next couple of years, we could have a problem. Now you had a whole sentence. But if the fire already started, what do you say? <laughs> you just say fire and scream. The word al-qari'ah, by just the, using that word by itself, it causes this alarm. And it causes the people, what, what qari'ah? And Allah Azza wa takes that next time and says, mal qari'ah? 
And you will never know what that qari'a is. First of all, it's an emergency, and you can't even know what that emergency is. Let me tell you. SubhanAllah. It's an incredible psychological you know, journey that, is, that we're being taken on in these ayat. Now let's talk a little bit more about the, the traditional interpretation of the word qari'a. We'll look at the tafsir of al-Shawkani, Alusi, and others. I'm just gonna read off some things in Arabic and translate for you quickly. وَالْقَارِعَةُ مِنَ الْقَرْعَ وَهُوَ الضَّرْبِ بِاعْتِمَادٍ شَدِيدٍ Qari'a comes from the word qari'a, which means to strike with great resolve, meaning strike something really hard. You meant to hit it. You know, there's sometimes you, meet, you hit something by accident. Qari'a can't be that. It has to be bi'atimad and shadeed. Mu'tamid on purpose. And you hit it really hard on purpose. Wahiya min asma'il qiyamah fil Quran. And it's, of course, from the names of Resurrection Day in the Quran. Qila summiyat biha li annaha taqra'u al qulub bil fazr. It is said that it's called al qari'a because on that day hearts will be rattled out of fear. And it's called the day of judgment because the, the enemies of Allah will be rattled on that day because of punishment. So that's one opinion we find traditionally. And it's said that Allah repeated the word three times to let you know how heavy this calamity is. So the three times repetition makes it three times as heavy and emphatic. The to, to make it grand, التفخيم to make it heavier and to make it scarier. مع كونها معلومة إشارة إلى تعظيم أمرها وتفخيمه. This we already discussed. Then القرع uh, uh, again similar wording. I'll, I'll actually go straight to أن القارعة هي التي تقرع الناس بالأهوال والإفزاع. This Alusi رحمه الله he says this قارعة is that which will rattle people out of terror and an absolute fear. وذلك في السماوات بالانشقاق. And when this happens in the skies, the, the term used is what? انشقاق and انفطار. We talked about these in Surah Al-Inshiqaq and Surah Al-Infitar. And when it happens in the sun and the moon, Allah uses the word At-Takweer. And when it happens with the stars, He uses the word Intithar. وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ انْتَثَرَتْ For example. And when it happens with the mountains, the word Dak and Nasaf, وَنُسِفَتِ الْجِبَالِ وَإِذَا الْجِبَالِ نُسِفَتْ You know, and then uh, Dakka. وَفِي الْأَرْضِ بِالطَّيِّ وَالتَّبْدِيلِ so أنها تقرأ عداء الله similar wording again that the rattling will happen because of the uh, against the enemies of Allah and this will be a humiliation against them. So th- these are basically some things that have been said traditionally about these ayat. One final comment, you know what happens? The reason I appreciated the commentary of a Sha'rawi rahimahullah, he went beyond just saying, okay, it's emphatic. It's a, it's there to tell you how important it is, and that's it. Because that's oversimplification. And he, rahimahullah, is a master of Arabic literature and language, and he sees things, and he analyzes them, and he, he, one of his great contributions to the ummah is that he put very complex linguistic concepts in language that a dummy like me can understand. Like he simplified things. And he took things that are written in very, very technical form in books of Balagha, and put them that, you know, a kid can re- listen to it and say, I get it. That's pretty cool, that's pretty simple. And so it's kind of being true to the ancient Arabs because they said they, they talked about very complex things in very simple language. This was one of their you know, qualities. And this is really part of genius because genius is that which can take something complex and present it with simplicity. Right? Presenting something complex in complicated language is easy, actually. Taking something complicated and making it simple, now that's genius. That's, that's something to be appreciated. And of course, that's the profound wisdom of the Quran. It presents things in such simple language and yet at the same time it's so deep and so profound. Such brief language and so much is embedded in it. The other uh, issue that should be brought to our attention is Al-Qari'a. Some, a grammatical opinion of it is Al-Qari'a is the subject of, of the sentence. And Mal-Qari'a is the predicate. Okay? Which is strange because a subject and predicate, a muftada and khabar in Arabic and as in many other languages, the subject creates a question and the, the, the predicate answers that question. In other words, when I say, for example, a Muslim, that's my subject. Okay, the question is, what about a Muslim? Okay, let me tell you, a Muslim is honest. Now I've given you the predicate, which is that he is honest. So the the predicate generally tends to give you information about the subject. The khabar gives you information about the mubtada. That's exactly why it's called khabar. So the criticism of that grammatical opinion is, how can the khabar be a question? If mal qari'a, what is al qari'a? Is the khabar? And Al-Qari'a, the first ayah, is the Mubtada. Then how can the, the khabar be a question in and of itself? 
How does that make sense? And the response to that by Ash-Shawkani rahimahullah is لِأَنَّا كُنَّا نَظُنُّ أَنَّهَا قَارِعَةٌ كَسَائِرِ الْقَوَارِ That we used to assume that this is going to be any other qari'ah, any other rattling sound, like any other. It's going to be just another because the word qari'ah is generic like we said. But to make, to, for Allah to make us realize this qari'ah that I'm talking about cannot be compared to any other qari'ah that you're used to hearing about. Allah Azza wa made the predicate a question itself so you realize this is not like any other. Not like any other rattler. فَبِهَذَا التَّجْهِيلَ عَلَّمَنَا أَنَّهَا قَارِعَةٌ And because of that, that massive ignorance, he informed us that this is a special qari'ah. فَاقَتِ الْقَوَارِعِ فِي الْهَوْلِ وَالشِدَّةِ It pales all the other rattling calamities in its, its uh, uh, terror and its intensity. SubhanAllah. So Ash-Shawkani comments, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ وَأَيُّ شَيْءٍ أَعْلَمَكَ مَا شَأْنِ الْقَارِعَةِ what will give you any idea of what time or what situation that qari'ah will be in? That's how he basically uh, interprets that word. Okay. Now finally, we'll talk a little bit about what uh, Ar-Razi says in uh, Tafsir al-Kabir. And before we do, I do want to make and remind you of a comment we made a long time ago when we were discussing some other ayat where the phrase, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ occurred. مَا أَدْرَاكَ comes up many times in the Qur'an. Allah says here, He says, مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ He says, مَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ قَرِيبٌ مَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ تَكُونُ قَرِيبًا مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الطَّارِقُ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْعَقَبَةَ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينَ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الْفَصْلِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا سَقَرْ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَهْ In this surah وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْحُطَمَةِ So many places we find ما أدرا... What will give you a clue? But it occurs in two ways Past tense and present tense or In Arabic the present tense is combined with the future tense So in other words what the meaning is If you say وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ What would give you a clue? وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ what will give you a clue? The, the cool thing in the Qur'an, the interesting thing is whenever adraka is mentioned, Allah answers it. Allah will tell you. What would have given you? Well, this would give you. What will give you a clue? Allah will not answer that question. He'll leave the question open-ended. So Allah Azza wa says, for example, وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ السَّاعَةَ قَرِيبٌ What will give you a clue? Perhaps the hour is near. Or perhaps it's not. He won't answer that question. He'll just leave it. Perhaps. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ What will give you a clue? Maybe he wants to purify, cleanse himself. No, when somebody wants to become pure or clean, where is that intent? It's in the heart. And who knows what's inside the heart? Only Allah. You will not know. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ لَا نُزَكِّي عَلَى اللَّهِ أَحَدًا We don't attribute purity again, you know, as, as opposed to Allah for anyone. We can't because only Allah knows what's in the hearts. لَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ don't consider yourselves you know, pure. Don't be self-righteous. Allah declares pure whoever He wills. Right? They're, they're the word yudrika. But here, like in Laylatul Qadr, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا لَيْلَةُ الْقَدْرِ What will give you any clue what Laylatul Qadr is? What is the value of Laylatul Qadr? Did He tell us what the value is? Yes, Laylatul Qadri خَيْرٌ مِنْ أَلْفِ He answered the question. Similarly here He says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ and the rest of the surah tells us what al-qari'ah is. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُورِ وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْأَهْلِ الْمَلْفُورِ The entire surah is now an answer to what? مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ So this is part of the subtlety of the Qur'an. Finally, Razi, just uh, uh, further fortifying what we said about uh, the, the single use of the word al-qari'ah. And وُجُوهُ أَحَدُهَا or أَحَدِهَا the reason for using one word in the ayah by itself, annahu tahdhirun, it is used for warning, just like I said, fire, used for warning, right? وَقَدْ جَاءَ التَّحْذِيرِ بِالرَّفْعِ وَالنَّصْبِ This warning, one word warning can occur in Arabic in raf' form or in nasb form, so you could say for example, annaru, fire. You could also say, annara, fire. You could, you could call for fire that way too. Like al-asad, al-asad, that's used in Arabic. فَيُجُوزُ الرَّفْعِ وَالنَّصْبِ وَالثَّانِيَ Okay. Now we come to the next ayah. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُورِ The day on which people, the word nas is used, nas is used as opposed to al-insan. Uh, the word insan uh, alludes to the singularity of the human being. When Allah talks about something that will be felt personally, individually, then we find the word insan. Uh, so Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, says, وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ You know, two surahs ago we said, وَقَالَ 
insanu mala. In the previous surah, right before this one, in the Adiyat, Allah said, "Inna al-insana li Rabbihi lakanud." Ingratitude, disloyalty. Who is the criminal? Indivi- society or the individual? The individual. First and foremost, the individual. But in this surah, now we're finding nas, nas. Let's see what's appropriate about using the word nas here. And as we go further, we're going to find again insan. When, when we get to Surah Al-Asr, when Asr in al insan. When we get to Surah Al-Nas, Nas again. So there's Nas, there's insan, there's Nas, there's people, human being, people, human being. Some even argue that Nas is the plural of insan. Even though it's ism jama, it can be used as a collective noun in and of itself, as far as Arabic is concerned. Anyhow, let's talk about the benefit of the word Nas. Allah says, the day on which people are going to be kal farash al mabthuth. Farash are moths. Moths. It's also the bugs that are, you know when you turn a light on, all these little tiny bugs trying to hit the light, and they're going in every direction. Those, those are farash. The plural of farasha, actually, in Arabic. Okay? These bugs, Allah says people will be like farash. These little tiny bugs going in every which direction. These moths. al mabthuth. <coughs> this is the adjective given to them. Dispersed, spread out. Now farash by itself is spread out. But he made it even more spread out by the word al mabthuth And this parallel is being given to people. This scene, is this an individual scene or a collective scene? This is a collective scene, so the word nas is more appropriate. The word nas is here, more suited. Okay. Now, batha to be widespread. Now, what are the benefits of using this, uh, uh, this image, al-farash al-mabthuth, with people on the Day of Judgment? First of all, there's, there's many, 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 there are countless bugs, there are countless insects, insects going in every which direction. Then there's chaos in them. They're not moving in one direction or another direction. They're going in every which direction. And they're even running into each other. They're even running into each other. And so by using this parallel of us with al-farash al-mabthuth, Allah is describing the chaos we're going to look like on the Day of Judgment. This is what's going to happen. In other words, when that rattling sound happens, you will be so wrecked, you will be so shocked, that this is what's going to happen to all of you. يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ قيل شبه الناس عند البعث بالفراش لأن الفراش إذا ثار لم يتجه إلى جهة واحدة. It said that people will be people are given uh, or alluded to by making a, a reference to these moths that are scattered in every direction because when they move they don't move in one direction. كسائر الطي like birds that move in a flock and they go in one direction as opposed to them. وكذلك الناس إذا خرجوا من قبورهم أحاط بهم الفزع. And just like that, and additionally, when people come out of their graves, uh, they will be overwhelmed by terror, just like these bugs. That there, it's an image of chaos when you see all that motion happening at the same time. It's an image of chaos and dis- disturbance. فَتَوَجَّهُ جِهَاتٍ شَتَّى أَوْ تَوَجَّهُ إِلَى مَنَازِلِهِمُ الْمُخْتَلِفَةِ سُعَادَةَ وَشِقَاءَ uh, what he's saying is that they're going to be going in every which direction and eventually end up in one of two, the direction of happiness or the direction of calamity and, uh, and sadness. When mabthuth min al bath wa huwa tafriq and mabthuth, the word mabthuth, which is an ism mafrood, an objective noun, comes from the word bath and it means division, distinction. So they'll be separated from one another. Even though they're together, they're also separated, which is a, a, an incredible thing. That on the Day of Judgment, we will be the biggest gathering ever of human beings. All generations of human beings are coming together at one point. And yet, this will be the day you will feel the loneliest. You will be the most alone. You will be separated from everybody else. And this is described in further, more explicit detail. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Right? In Surah Al-Mu'arij, even وَفَصِيلَتِهِ الَّتِي تُؤْوِيهِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُؤْوِيهِ Right, so ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ Right, he's, he, he offers Allah everybody. He even says, separate me from my tribe in addition to my family. How about this? Why don't you take everyone on earth into hell? Let me go. He'll offer everybody else. Right, وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ Give everybody else up, just let me survive. That's what he's concerned about. So you become completely individualized on that day. وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ and mountains will become on that day like al ihn Al-Ihn in the Arabic language is wool of different textures. You know, you have, and when you, when you make wool in Arabic, you know, and, and it's not like, they didn't have cotton really. They, all they had to work with was wool. It's not a society that had flowing cotton. Cotton was an import really. So when Allah makes reference to this kind of carding, usually it's associated with cotton, but in Arab society, the first thing that came to their mind was wool. So al is used wool. 
And then Allah uses the word al-manfush. The word nafasha in Arabic is to card and scrape into fine lines. You know when you card and scrape the wool, it becomes fine fibers. And then they're brought together and intertwined. And al ihn is used for, for wool that is of multiple textures. And when you're carding, you know what happens? These really fine fibers, they start flying up into the air. They become weightless and there's this, you know, you have to wear some clips and everything because you're going to get like, it's the dust of it is going to go in your, you know, kind of like sawdust kind of thing. But this happens with wool a lot. So Allah is describing mountains as this weightless thing that when it's scraped, it's almost like it's flying in the air and the different textures of it implied inside the word al ihn benefits us in that mountains are of different colors. But they're going to be slammed together and scraped together to the point where first of all, there's this different colored textured dust coming out of them, just like wool, when they're scraped together, subhanAllah. And, so we're, and we're, being, we're learning that mountains will not stay in, in one place. Because the mountainous region of one place is of one color, and the mountainous region of another place is a different color, but now they're all slamming into each other, they're making moves towards each other, subhanAllah. So, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلِعْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ uh, an interesting rhetorical question is, well, Allah Azza wa Jalla here He says al manfush, but in Surah Al Ma'arij He said wa takunu al jibalu kal ihn. He did not say al ihn al manfush. In Surah Al Qari'ah He uses the word al manfush, but there He didn't. فلف al Qari'ah أنسب شيء لهذا التعبير. This has to do with the placement of a word in a surah which is best suited for it. The surah began with the word Qari'ah. And qari'ah, literally, one of its meaning is to beat something with a stick, to make a loud noise. Remember we said when the slave gets beat, the word asa was used with it, right? Even sometimes the knocking in ancient times, the knocking on the door wasn't done with your hand. What was it done with? The stick, you, stab, you, you, you slam it on the door, right? Now one of the means in ancient times for carding wool was not just to scrape it, but to also what? To beat it, to beat it. And so the word manfush is more particular and more suited in this context because other words have that same flavor, that same texture in them, subhanAllah. So, and, and by the way, we find a, a, a similar meaning in the word, uh, you know, uh, uh, when Allah Azza talks about in the previous ayah, al-farash al-mabthuth, this, this moths that go in every direction, if moths are sitting peacefully and you strike, what happens? They fly up and they go in every direction. So the words, the, 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 they're beautifully woven together in the surah, and they, their texture comes together. The texture of words and how they correlate with each other, one of the great tafasir in our history that deals with this subject is Safwatu Tafasir by as sabuni rahimahullah. Absolutely brilliant work, where he talks about the rhetorical benefits of words and how they contrast each other within a surah and parallel each other and complement each other to create a full image. Al-Ihn as-Suf dhu alwanin mukhtalifah. Al-Ihn is wool made up of different colors. وَالْمَنْفُوشْ مِنَ النَّفَشْ وَهُوَ نَشْرُ الصُّوفِ بِنَذْفْ وَنَحْوِهِ فَالْعِهْنُ الْمَنْفُوشْ الصُّوفُ الْمُنْتَشِرِ In the end what he's saying is that this carded wool or this beet wool is wool that is dispersed ذُو أَلْوَانٍ مُخْتَلِفَةٍ Made up of different colors إِلَى إِشَارَةً إِلَى تَلَاشِ الْجِبَالِ عَلَى اخْتِلَافِ أَلْوَانِهَا بِزَلْزَلَةِ السَّاعَةِ It is an indication or a clue given by Allah about the calamity of the mountains and how they're going to strike against each other and these different colors are going to manifest themselves because of the earthquake of the hour. فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ Now we get to the final part. And as for the one whose scales, I'm roughly translating, uh, as for the one whose scales became heavy. You know what's incredible about that? An ayah ago, mountains became weightless. And now what's becoming heavy? The scales. It's a beautiful contrast. It's incredible. This is a day when everything's changed. You know, in, in this dunya right now, when you do, do good deeds, everybody around you says this is worthless. There's no way to it. And when they see a mountain, the first thing to their mind is this is solid. Because their vision is that of what they can see. They accept. What they cannot see, they don't accept. But on the Day of Judgment, Allah Azza wa reverses this. And so the mountains become weightless, and your deeds are now heavy. They've been given. Thaqulat mawazin. What an amazing contrast in the surah. The thing, you know, what, what will be weighed? There are different hadith and there are different texts in the Quran and Sunnah that allude to what will be weighed. Obviously, we know our deeds are going to be weighed. That's obviously there. Okay, the deed will be weighed. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Allah Azza wa the hadith of the Messenger وسلم, allude to even persons being weighed. The Sahaba would make fun of a light weighted Sahabi, right? Or his beard, he can't grow a beard, he just got one hair. And he says, Beware of his beard. 
Be aware of that here. It'll weigh, it'll weigh heavier than the mountain of Uhud on the Day of Judgment. Right? So, I mean, there, there's alluding to a person's weight. I mean, even the Messenger alludes, so I saw him in another narration, to a person who's very heavy set. But when he comes before Allah on the Day of Judgment, he won't weigh anything more than a mosquito. So there's the weight of a person. Then, of course, there's the weight of our deeds. There's the weight of our deeds. And uh, some scholars even add to this the weight of our intentions. The weight of our intentions and our, our sincerity in our deeds. Anyhow. So Allah says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ There are a few interesting things here to note. Allah says, man, singular. Even though it can be used as ism jama', the, it's clear that it's plural here because it's not mawazinuhum, it's mawazinuhu. So if it's one person, why mention his scales? Mawazin. Mizan is one. Mizan means a scale. If his scale becomes heavy or his scale becomes light. But Allah doesn't say mizan, He says mawazin. The word mawazin is the plural of two possible words. It could be the plural of the word mizan. Mizan, plural mawazin. And it could also be the plural of the word mawzun. Mawzun, ism maf'ul. But what's the difference between mizan and mawzun? This is very important for us to understand this ayah. The word mizan literally refers to an ism ala, a scale. Typically, a scale has two sides, right? One side has the weights, the other side has the groceries or whatever you're going to put on it. And when they balance out, now you know how much this, this side weighs, the left side or the right side weighs. Okay. But then there's the word mawzun. Mawzun means the thing that is about to be weighed. That which is being put on the scale is called mawzun. And actually, more scholars incline towards this word when it comes to this ayah. And we'll see why. We'll see why. And we'll look at other places in the Quran where this is established. The image that comes in our mind usually when we talk about scales is that there are two sides. And the image that comes to our mind is on the one side there are going to be good deeds, on the other side there's going to be what? Bad deeds and whichever weighs more, that's where you're going and that's where you're headed. But actually if you study the Qur'an's text and the Sunnah's text carefully, there's a different image being presented. An image that is eluded most people's mind and imagination when it comes to the scales. This is the image that most people think of, but this is actually not the image explicitly described in the Qur'an at all. Something else is described, so let's talk about that. The idea is as follows. Allah Azza wa Jalla describes that evil deeds will have no weight. Evil deeds will have no weight. And the only things that will have weight is good deeds. That's the only thing that will have weight. Now this is closer to, you know, like a modern scale that they have those magnetic scales and those spring scales. There's no two things. You just put it on top of this one thing. If it weighs something, it'll show. If it's weightless, it won't show. That's the kind of scale we're kind of talking about here. If it has some weight, it'll expose its weight. If it has no weight, it will be nothing. For example, وَقَدِمْنَا إِلَى مَا عَمِلُوا مِنْ عَمَلٍ فَجَعَلْنَاهُ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا Well, they'll come, we'll approach whatever they had done. Whatever deeds they had done, kuffar. They had done some good deeds too. And Allah said, we'll make it, make it scattered dust. Now what is the weight of scattered dust? Nothing. It's dust. It's weightless. Allah will make their deeds worthless by making them weightless. By making them weightless. So let's look at these four or five places in the Qur'an where this subject is dealt with that will give us more clarity, inshaAllah. وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ This is in Surah Al-Anbiya. وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطِ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And we will establish the scales, if you will, of justice on the day of resurrection. فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا And no one will, not even a single person will be wronged in any matter. وَإِن كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا وَكَفَى بِنَا حَاسِبِينَ And had there even been the, the, wor- the amount of a seed, of mustard, if that much of a weight was there, we would give it to them. Allah Azza wa Jalla doesn't say a worth of good deeds. He just says deed. If a deed was worth even a mustard seed, we would give it, atayna biha, we will give them that. And we are enough to take account. In other words, the only thing that will have, Allah will give to them means it's good deed. And what that implies is only good deeds will carry weight. We go further, we find, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَ إِذِنِ الْحَقِّ Weight will actually only be a, a company, uh, 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 weight will only be the property of the truth. Meaning if you don't have truth, if you don't have iman, you have no weight. And only the, that which are true deeds, good deeds will actually carry 
Wait, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ And because only truth actually carries weight on that day, whose ever scales became heavy, then those are truly the successful. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ And as opposed to that, whose ever weights became light. In other words, their, their deeds don't carry any weight. فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَظْلِمُونَ they are the ones who they're the ones who've wronged themselves and they've they've put themselves in tremendous loss because of them especially making or doing wrong in regards to our miraculous signs. Look at this other ayah. This is in Surah Al Kahf. He says, Those are the ones who disbelieved in the ayat of their master, the miraculous signs of their master, and in meeting him, Fahabiqat Amaluhum, then all of their deeds will be seized. فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا Then we will not establish any weight for them whatsoever. In other words, what we're learning over and over again is, good deeds have weight, bad deeds have no weight. Because when Allah seizes their deeds, Allah says, I will refuse to establish any wazn for them. I will refuse to establish any weight for them. This is a contrast from what we read in Surah Al-Zilzal. We read, فَأَمَّا You know, when Allah Azza wa Jalla says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ they will see the weight, even the, the, the weight of a speck they will see. But it wasn't being weighed yet, it was just being what? Seen. But then the intentions were added, when the intentions were added, there was no iman in those intentions, they became weightless and now we come to these ayah. Now the scale is worthless. Okay. There they at least saw this, maybe it weighs something. Maybe it's something. But when they come to this, haba'am manthura, it's become worthless. So, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah says, as for the one whose scales became heavy, then those are the truly successful. In other words, Allah is not saying whose good deeds weigh more than their bad deeds. The, the real issue here is, your, your good deeds actually have weight. In other words, they were accepted by Allah. The intentions were good. The way you performed them were good. Mufti Muhammad Shafi'i rahimahullah added, if you want to make sure your deeds are heavy, do two things. Make sure they have sincerity and make sure you're following the procedure set by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't come up with your own good deeds. Stick to those two things and you'll be safe. So Allah, and he says, in his Allahu A'lam, he says that in my estimation, the, deed, the, the weight of a deed will be judged by two things. How sincere you were and how close to the sunnah of the Prophet it was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you, the closer you are and the more sincere you are, the heavier that even the small deed becomes. It becomes heavier and heavier. May Allah Azza wa Jal make our scales heavy. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فِي جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدُونَ And whose, whose ever scales were made light. Now the word, I keep translating scales, but it's those things that are to be weighed also. Because mawzun, the word, if it's the plural of mawzun, it's not just scales, it's the objects that are put on the scale. If those objects themselves are heavy, or if those objects themselves are light, that's part of the meaning of the ayah. So it's the, the deeds themselves that are carrying weight. Then he says, okay, so if the deeds become heavy, فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ Then he will be in Isha. Now Isha is different from Hayat. In the you know, English translation, Isha, Hayat translated as life. Okay? Uh, Isha comes from Aish. Aish in Arabic. Which means to have a life in which you have no worry of food and shelter. Okay? Any life is Hayat. أَخَصْ مِنْهُ Aisha. Aisha, there, there's no worry about food and shelter. Meaning the necessities of your life are not a concern for you at all. Then you are in Aish. Those of you who speak Arabic, or, or Urdu rather, Aish karrein. Right? You know what that means? Oh, we're living it up. No worries. Right? That's, it's kind of derived from there. But the Arabic meaning originally is, is exactly that. It's to have a, a life free of concern. And this is actually the life that, that's described even of wild animals in the woods. Because there's no shortage of shelter and there's no shortage of predators especially. There's no shortage of prey that they can pounce upon. فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ Then there's the word radiyah. The word radiyah literally means the one who is pleased. Literally it means the one who is pleased. So as an adjective of Isha, it's, it's actually unique. A life that is pleased. Hmm. A life full, full of pleasure, thati ridan, which is how some of us would have interpreted it, is correct. A life that is full of contentment. But in, the, in Arabic rhetoric, you can say, you know, uh, 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 an overjoyed life. You didn't describe the person, you described the life. Right? You didn't describe the person, but you described the life. And this is so to understand that this, the entire life, not a moment, not a breath will go by 
where the joy won't be there, not where the joy will be missing, where the contentment will be missing. There will not be a moment of boredom or, or of, you know, of dissatisfaction. So, Aishatin radiya, Zati Ribbon, as for example, Al Alusi rahimahullah says. So uh, now we come to the, the, the horrifying next ayah, wa amma man khaffat mawazinuhu, as for the ones whose scales are lightened. Takhfif in Arabic, to lighten. And you know what's really cool about this? On the Day of Judgment, we want this huge burden of good deeds, right? But in this dunya, when Allah gives us ahkam, you know what He says? Yuridullahu li yukhaffifa ankum. Allah intends to lighten your burden from you. In other words, when you follow Allah's commandments, life in this world becomes light. Light. Life becomes easy and your scales are getting heavier in the Day of Judgment. The contrast between the two things in the Qur'an's language. So he says, And as for the one whose scales became lightened, the ayah ended, it didn't go straight to, it stopped there, because he wants you to think. As for the one whose scales became light, you stop there. You don't just go straight to فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةَ You reflect on every single ayah, you stop and reflect on it. What's gonna happen? And how, what's the worst that could, what the kafir is saying? Yeah, so it became light, what's the big deal? And Allah Azza wa adds now, He teaches, He says فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةَ Both words, very very powerful. The word هَاوِيَةَ first, we'll come to um, which is even scarier second, we'll come to هَاوِيَةَ first. The word هَاوِيَ in Arabic comes from huwa, which actually means to fall into a steep canyon. And it's usually used for a hawk or a bird of prey that sees an animal way down at the bottom of the valley and what does it do? It dives down at full speed. It's faster than even falling. When you're falling down, all you have to your advantage is gravity. But the bird is even forcing itself to launch itself further down, way, way deep into the valley to snatch its prey. That's what it's trying to do. In Arabic idiom, you know, uh, actually I'll, t I'll tell you the idiom at the end. The word Hawiyah is referred to by Imam Madhari rahimahullah. He says that this is a canyon in hellfire so deep that only Allah knows its depth. So first of all, the location is such, and the one falling in it, or the one going to Hawiyah is what? Endlessly just falling way, 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 way down. That's described just in the word Hawiyah. But then we find this really interesting expression of the Arabs. They would say for somebody who's having a really, really hard time, or they're like, uh, uh, they're in, in, on, in a horrible, horrible calamity, they would say, huwat ummuhu. Same verb is used, hawiya, huwat ummuhu. What that means is his mother fell off a cliff into a deep canyon. They don't really mean his mother fell off a cliff. They're saying, man, you're looking like your mother fell off a cliff. But she dove right in. This, that's how you look. You look that depressed, you look that disturbed. Now, both words are used in the ayah, but the arrangement is changed. So Allah took the expression of the Arabs, but did something new with it. And this is again a, a feature of the Qur'an. فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةً Then his mother, I'm translating literally, his mother is the deep canyon in hellfire. His mother is that deep canyon in hell. Okay. What does it mean, his mother? Ummuhu. We learn a few things from that. First of all, a child, it runs to its mother. And whether you like it or not, if the, if the person is headed for hellfire, they will run towards it whether they want to or not. Who wants to run to hellfire? Nobody. A child, you don't have to tell them to want to run to their mother, they naturally run to their mother. But on the day of judgment, your body will rebel against you, no matter how much you want to run away from it. وَيَصْلَى you know, uh, First he will say, give me death, don't take me there, and then he'll throw himself in. He'll go himself, jump in himself, because he can't even help himself at this point. Just like a child can't help himself run towards its mother. The other benefit of the word ummuhu here is a mother wraps its child around and protects it and doesn't let it go. It's the sense of motherhood that she has. And also a mother, when she's carrying the baby, the child is inside and can't come out. He's inside. And you know what this implies? The, this, this, the, the mother for this person, the role of mother, the hellfire is gonna hug him and not let him go. And be very protective and owner, you know, owning of him. Not, let, not release him. And he's trapped in it like a child trapped in the womb of the mother. SubhanAllah. فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَ It's a, such a powerful rendition of uh, the phrase. Then he says, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ And what will give you a clue as to what it is? مَا هِيَ He doesn't say, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْهَاوِيَ In the beginning he said, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ He didn't repeat هَاوِيَ He said, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ And the difference, this is again rhetoric in the Qur'an. 
The first word qari'a was familiar to the Arabs. It was familiar. And they can compare a qari'a they've seen and then make qiyas about the qari'a that's going to happen. Even though Allah teaches them you really can't. But at least in their mind, yes qari'a is a familiar term. The word hawiya, the way it's being used here, completely unfamiliar to the Arabs. Plus it's not even describing something that will happen on the earth, it's describing hellfire. Completely in the ghayb. It's distant from them, and to allude to something distant, the pronoun is used here. That's how it's used in the Qur'an. We will find in other places though, when, descri- when hellfire is being described, we'll find in Surah Al-Humazah, after Surah Al-Asr, وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَلْحُطَمَةً Malhutama. We don't find ma adraka ma hiya, but we find ma adraka mal hutama. So what's the difference between using a pronoun for hellfire and an, an actual noun? Well, rhetorically we say a pronoun is used in cases where you want to be brief. And a full noun is used in cases where you want to be more descriptive. Because a pronoun tells you less and a noun tells you more. If I say, for example, the farmer went to town, I told you more. If I said he went to town, I told you less. You know less now than you would know if I told you the farmer, if I, sent, I mentioned him by the noun. In Surah, Al, in Surah Al-Humaza, when we get to Al-Hutamah, we'll find there's far more description of hellfire there. وَمَا أَضْرَكَ مَا الْحُطَمَةِ نَارُ اللَّهِ الْمُوْقَدَةِ الَّتِي تَطَّلِعُ عَلَى الْأَفْئِدَةِ إِنَّهَا عَلَيْهِمْ مُؤْصَدَةِ فِي عَمَدٍ مُمَدَّدَةِ A whole passage dedicated to detail about what this hellfire is. Is there that much detail here? No. وَمَا أَضْرَكَ مَا هِيَا And what's the description? It's brief by comparison. نَارُ الْحَامِيَةِ And there's this consistency in the Qur'an. When you compare texts, the, the text that is less descriptive will show you justification of why it's less descriptive. And the text that is more descriptive will justify itself by use of more descriptive language even. Even the word, you know, just by knowing hiya is used, we're expecting less. By hearing hutama there, we're expecting more. And more is given to us, subhanAllah. Then we find that the word at the end of this is mahiya. There's a ha at the end. The word hiya in Arabic means she. The word hiya means she. There's no ha at the end of it. But Allah Azza wa Jal adds a ha. This is ha tahwil to terrify. This ha at the end of a word in Arabic is to magnify and to give weight to a word. When you pronounce the ha, you pronounce it from your diaphragm. And this is a means by which you are to scare your audience when you speak. Actually, I can give you a, a, maybe a, a crude English parallel. What did you say? And at the end, the diaphragm at the end, to add, to terrorize the audience. And this is done actually in Arabic. And when somebody is really overwhelmed and excited, then they put a high at the end of their words. It just enunciates that way. This happens in the Quran elsewhere. Allah says, فَأَمَّا مَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابَهُ بِيَمِينِهِ فَيَقُولُ هَا أُمُّ قْرَأُوا كِتَابِي No, no, no. هَا أُمُّ قْرَأُوا كِتَابِيَا There's a high at the end. Excitement. This is, this is a magnification and an, and an expression of power. So Allah says, ما هي? Do you have any idea what that is? And there's, a, there's an anger in the ayah and we can capture the anger in the ha that's captured at the end. This ha at the end is the, it benefits magnifying the matter of fire and to give it its, its heavy weight. وَلَمْ يَقُلْ وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هَاوِيَةَ فَمَا الْفَرْقِ This is what Razi says. Well, he didn't say, what is هَاوِيَةَ, why not? And we talked about this before, but let's just see what he has to say. الْفَرْقْ أَنَّ كَوْنَهَا قَارِعَةٌ أَمْرٌ مَحْسُوسٌ In the beginning when qari'ah was mentioned, it is something that can be experienced. It's something, at least some kind of qari'ah you can still experience. It's أَمْرٌ مَحْسُوسٌ So al-qari'ah, a closer to experience, the noun itself is mentioned. أَمَّا كَوْلُهَا هَاوِيَةَ فَلَيْسَ كَذَلِكَ But the existence of hawiya is not that way. So the, the, it's, distant, it's distanced from us by use of the pronoun, subhanAllah. Last ayah, inshaAllah ta'ala, نَارٌ hamia. He asked the question, he answers it. Why does he answer it? Because he said, مَا أَدْرَاكَ If he says, مَا يُدْرِيكَ You don't find answer. When he says, مَا أَدْرَاكَ You find answer. The first question was, مَا, ما أَدْرَاكَ مَا الْقَارِعَ We found an answer. Now another question, مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا هِيَ and now we're going to find the answer again. By the way, this is a surah about hellfire. In the end, it's about more detail about hellfire. The surah before and the surah after talks about the kind of people that deserve hellfire. It's sandwiched in between them. The surah before, in the insana, li rabbihi lakanud. The surah after, al hakum al takathur, hatta zultum al maqabir. Both of the groups that need to be warned. And in between the two groups, you have a surah that deals with their fate. 
the hellfire. أي حارة شديدة الحرار الحرارة. The word nar, of course, we know is fire. The word hamia means intense fire, something that's very, very hot and 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 flame. وهو جواب الاستفهام. It's of course the answer to the question ما هي تفسير لهاوية. This is a tafsir of the word hamia itself. نعت له له نعت له لها وهو من الحما. This is an adjective of fire, and it comes from the word hima, which means ishtidad ishtidad al har. It means the intensity of flame and fire. Of course, we learn from prophetic narrations of the Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that the fire of hell is at least seventy times, meaning the fire we have here in the world is one of seventy parts of the fire in hell and its intensity. May Allah Azza wa Jalla protect us from it. And al qamus, it even says, you know, humi al shams, meaning the sun's flame is called hima also its its intensity is called hima also at that place not the one that reaches us but the one that's over there is called hima also so with that inshallah ta'ala we conclude i want to just mention one or two things about the coherence of the surah and how it's tied the beginning of it is tied to the end of it allah azza wa jal scared us in the beginning with the word al qari'ah he scares us more at the end with the words narun hamia he opened the surah with a question and an answer. وَمَا أَدْرَكَ مَا الْقَارِعَةِ He closes the surah with a question and answer. وَمَا أَدْرَكَ مَا هِيَ نَارٌ حَامِيَةِ So the beginning is rhetorically tied to its own conclusion. بَارَكَ اللَّهُ لِي وَلَكُمْ فِي الْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ وَنَفَعْنِي وَإِيَّاكُمْ بِالْآيَةِ وَالْحَكِيمِ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ